welcome to Grace Life Church Podcast. If you would like any more information about us, please visit our website, gracelife.com.au. Well, let's pray while we're standing. Eh? I might as well give you a proper spiritual reason to stand. Well, Father, we thank you for this morning, God. We thank you that we've already heard your grace among us. We've worshipped and we've sung. And Lord, we pray by scriptures this morning that you would speak to us, that you would speak into our hearts. You would encourage, you would challenge, you would impart, and you would grow us. Lord, we we desire to know you more, to know you greater, and to, to move forward in this journey with you. So we pray that by your grace, that your Holy Spirit would just bring revelation to us this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can grab your seat. We have been journeying through the gospel according to Mark. Who's been enjoying reading Mark's gospel? Okay, two, three, four of us. That's good. I never take those as proper indications, just in case you're worrying that only two or three people are actually reading through. Who's actually, I hope you are reading through Mark at the same time as we're kind of going through it. We are up to what chapter today? Chapter 4 this morning, and uh, we actually had Vicki Follington was booked in to, to minister this morning, but she got sick during the week, and she's lost her voice, and she's, uh, she's a primary school teacher, and has been looking after all those little primary school kids, as well as doing our kids' ministry, and so um, we're going to swap with her. So I'm actually going to be sharing this morning from Mark chapter 4, and uh, Just to start off with, I want to read from Mark chapter 4, verse 33 and 34. Okay? Verse 33 says, Jesus used many similar stories and illustrations to teach the people as much as they could understand. In fact, his public ministry, he never taught any, listen to this, he never taught without using parables. But afterward, When he was alone with his disciples, he explained everything to them. Now, we're going to bounce back and forth in Mark's gospel here. And I'm going to give a little bit of context into the one of the ways which Jesus teaches. As we've just read there, Mark makes makes note in between different parables that we read in Mark chapter 4 that this was a, a, a key way that Jesus would teach. He said... In fact, in his public ministry, he never taught without using parables, which is it's an interesting statement for Mark to make, and it makes us aware that that parables were a key to Jesus' ministry. Who's familiar with parables? Give me a a wave. A parable being a, a kind of a story, a drawing, a picture, an illustration that Jesus would use to to give illustration to what he was teaching. Okay, there were parables, were uh, often familiar stories that, that people would know, or there were picture, picture word pictures that would show different things that were around them that they could relate to. But deep within these parables, there was a significant meaning. Let's read what Jesus says about um, these parables again in Mark chapter 4, but this time in verse 9 to 12. Then he said, so he's just actually shared part of a parable. And then it says, then he said, anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. Later, when Jesus was alone with the 12 disciples and with the others who were gathered around, they asked him what the parables meant. He replied, you are permitted to understand the secret of the kingdom of God. But I use parables for everything I say to outsiders so that the scriptures might be fulfilled. When they see what I do, they will learn nothing. When they hear what I say, they will, under, they will not understand. Otherwise, they will turn to me and be forgiven. So the disciples actually, Jesus gives this parable at the start of Mark 4, and then the disciples are like, we didn't really understand that. What was that all about? And so Jesus not just tells them what the meaning of the parable is, which he does just after this, but he tells them the reason why he uses parables. 
He's using the parables to um, contain these secrets or the, the, these, what it says there, secret of the kingdom of God. He's, he's containing the, these truths within these parables that would be uh, only seen and heard by those who would seek to understand, who would lean in, who he would give revelation to. And so they're not just generalized stories. They are stories with keys within them. With, with, with these gems or these gold things within them that those who would seek out understanding would find what he was talking about. But those who would hear these parables that did not want to understand would not find the meaning or, or, or the, the things contained within it. And so it sets these, this apart. It can be that there, are, uh, there is a group of people listening to Jesus minister. They're hearing the same parable, the same story. And some of them would understand, would get revelation, and others would not. And the difference would be those who have been given that revelation, those who would seek that revelation, and those who would ask for understanding. I actually see this as a gracious gift of God even to those that he was speaking to who did not believe or did not want to believe. Because in hiding, in hiding or concealing within the parable the truth that was there, it, 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 it actually saved them from being accountable to what was in the parable or the, the condemnation of not hearing and adhering to what was in the parable. But to those who had ears to hear... There was the, the opening revelation, but also the accountability to what God was showing, what Jesus was saying in these parables. Are you with me? So he's illustrating the, these different truths, but it's only for people who would seek it, who would go deeper into that thing, which is a gift of God's grace. You can have a room full of people as we do today. And even in the house of God, we can have people who are listening to understand and people who are just kind of hearing. We can have people who are, are listening to seek out truth, who are listening to dig deeper into, the, into God's word, who are listening with the, with the desire to understand spiritual principles or dynamics of the kingdom. And then we can have people who just are kind of listening and just hearing. What is the difference? It's not necessarily what is being spoken. It is our attitude, our heart attitude toward what is being spoken. Are you someone who wants to seek what God is saying? Who wants to go deep into his word, into the, the meaning of what he's actually saying? Get into the depth of his word. Or are you just content with hearing someone speak or with reading the Bible without actually digging to go deeper. One of my favorite Proverbs at this point in time is Proverbs 25, verse 2. It says, it is, me and Mike were talking about this a while back. It is the glory of God to conceal things, but the glory of kings to search them out. Or in the NLT, it is God's privilege to conceal things and the king's privilege to discover them. You know, God puts within, even life, he puts these treasures, these, these, the, the depths of his heart toward us. And if we just kind of scratch the surface, if we just go through the motions, if we just kind of you know, skim through life, we actually can miss some of the depth of God's love and heart for us. Not just as we're reading the word, but as we're going through life. In, re in relationship, in friendship, we can miss some of those things that God has put deep in there for us to find. And it says that it's to his glory to conceal these things, to, to put them deep within. But it's actually to our glory or to our benefit or to our privilege that we would seek what it is that he's actually saying. So when we come to the parables that we see in Mark chapter 4 and throughout Jesus' teaching, uh, I encourage us not to just kind of take it at surface level, but to seek understanding. What are you saying, God? What are you saying to us? What, what are you wanting to, to show us? In verse 23 and 25, he says this, Anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. Again, the same thing. If you've got ears to hear, don't just join the sound team. Hear, listen to understand. If you've got ears to hear, then listen to understand. Then he, said, then he added, pay close attention to what you hear. 
The closer you listen, the more understanding you will be given, and you will receive even more. To those who listen to my teaching, more understanding will be given. But for those who are not listening, even what little understanding they have will be taken away. Did you catch that? As you listen, as you pay close attention, you are going to receive more understanding. What is the key to to receiving understanding? It's the posture of our hearts that seeks, that wants to lean in, that wants to dig deeper. God rewards those who diligently, earnestly seek Him. And what is the reward? More of Him. A greater understanding of Him. See, we can, we can put that into some sort of material basket to say uh, God rewards those who, who seek Him with material things. But that's not the point of what that, that Scripture means. It's that God re- rewards us with a deeper understanding of who He is. That is the greatest reward you could have in this life. It's not material things. It's not to get a new car. Those things are okay. But the, the, the deeper thing is relationship with Him. And he wants to give you more understanding of who he is. He wants to give you more revelation. But how is your heart towards that? If you listen, as he says right there, if you're listening to this, if you're paying attention, the more understanding you will be given. You will receive even more. Anyone got that posture in their heart today? I want to receive more of or more revelation from God, more understanding for to go deeper. I'm not talking about adding revelation to what, what, what he is saying. I'm talking about going deeper to what he actually is saying. Can we put that picture up, Lockie, of the scripture with the can you see that, that passage of scripture there? Imagine it like this. Give me, I'll give you a parable. That there is the word of God, which is alive and powerful. And deep within there, there are these diamonds. But only those who will go beyond what is seen on the surface will find what is contained in the depth. It's only those who will, will go deeper into the Word that will find those, those gems, those diamonds, or, or, or those, those revelations that, that God has for us. If you read the, 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 just the words, you're going to be blessed. If you read that, you're going to be blessed. If you read God's word, if you understand God's word, you're going to be blessed. But if you want to go a little bit deeper, there is more in there. Have you ever read a passage of scripture uh, and, you, and you know it? And then a couple of years later, you read it again and you're like, whoa, where did that come from? I didn't see that before. I, I, I didn't understand that before. As he teaches precepts upon precepts, he unloads and he shows us these depths of his word. And Jesus is saying to the disciples, there is so much more in this than what you're seeing at face, what you're taking at face value. And those who are okay to just kind of hear it, that's okay. But those who want to know, those who want to dig, those who want to go deeper, then I'm going to reward them. I'm going to reward them. I think we, you know, we can kind of get into, you know, even when it comes to, to preaching or teaching, we, come in, we get into the, like style. I like this style. I like that style. I like this. I like that. Do you know, would anyone ever say that Paul was a boring preacher? No, we wouldn't. But, you know, there was a, a moment when Paul was speaking. Have you got that passage there, Lockie? Where Paul is uh, ministering and... Who was it? Eutychus. As Paul spoke on and on, as Paul kept on preaching and going, a young man named Eutychus, sitting in the windowsill, became very drowsy, fell asleep. Finally, he fell fell sound asleep and dropped three stories to his death below. Was there anything wrong with Paul's teaching? Well, it was probably like one of those church services that just go on and on and on. And on, and this guy, Eutychus, falls asleep. So it's not about the style. It's about are we attentive to what is being said? Are we listening? Are we leaning into, regardless of how it comes across, 
the truth that may be contained in that. Because what we've done is we've made, even preaching and teaching, we've made it more about communication and techniques of how to communicate than it is about uh, bringing the actual truth out of the text so that God can do the work through his word in our hearts. And we get great communicators with shallow truth rather than just bringing the word and allowing the word to do the work in our hearts. But that comes back to my disposition. So I want to sit, no matter who is sharing, no matter who is opening the scriptures, I'm listening to see what can I get out of this. A kid, a two-year-old, probably can't really get much from a two-year-old, but maybe. I've had my kids kind of rebuke me at times for, for, you said this, Dad, or you didn't say that, or you didn't do this. I'm like, bang. Oh, God's ministering to me through that child. Trying to lean in and listen to what God is saying uh, and having that disposition. So can I, I, I challenge us as a church to, to hunger and thirst for him, to have a hunger for his word, the, the, the paradox of the kingdom is that um, those who are hungry as they feast, guess what? They don't just get full, they get hungrier. As you have a hunger for God's word, as you have a hunger for his presence, you don't get to the point where you're like, oh, I'm, I've had enough now. It's like, no, that hunger just continues to develop and get deeper and deeper and deeper. Can we be a church who hunger and thirst for him? Lean in, listen. God, I want to hear. He rewards those who diligently seek him. Now we're going to read from Mark chapter 4, verse 26 and 29. What we see that, that uh, Jesus is starting to do, if we look through you know, Mark chapter 1, we saw that the first thing Jesus said, he announces, he declares that the, the kingdom is here. So he heralds the kingdom. It is, is it, it is at hand. The kingdom is here. Remember that in Mark chapter 1. And then we see these signs and these healings uh, that take place after that. So he declares the kingdom. And then he demonstrates the kingdom is here. That The kingdom power has come. So he's declaring the kingdom is here. He's demonstrating the kingdom is here. And then we see in Mark chapter 4 that he starts to draw the kingdom. He starts to give illustration of what the kingdom of God actually looks like. And the, the parables contained within Mark chapter 4, uh, there's three or four of them in that chapter, they all show what the kingdom of God looks like. But here is a, here, here's a parable that I was reading just a couple of weeks ago that just uh, it apprehended and it felt like one of those things, oh, I want to go a little bit deeper into this. So G, verse 26, Jesus also said, The kingdom of God is like a farmer who scatters seed on the ground. Night and day, while he's asleep or awake, the seed sprouts and grows, but he does not understand how it happens. The earth produces the crop on its own. First a leaf blade pushes through, then the heads of wheat are formed, and finally the grain ripens. And as soon as the grain is ready, the farmer comes and harvests it with a sickle. With a what? With a sickle. For the harvest time has come. So Jesus is now starting to draw the, the kingdom for them. Let me give you some illustration. You've heard that the kingdom is at hand. You've started to see the power of the kingdom at work. Now let me show you what it looks like, the kingdom. He declares, he, he demonstrates, and now he starts to draw. And these parables are that he's giving to, to the disciples and to those who are around to give what the kingdom actually looks like. The kingdom of God is like a farmer who scatters seed on the ground. Night and day, while he's asleep or awake, the seed sprouts and grows, but he does not understand how it happens. The earth produces the crop on its own. I first read that and I was like, wow. Even just in that, that's given me a key to just release things to God. That, that the farmer scatters the seed on the ground, and night and day, while he's asleep or awake, the seed sprouts and grows, and he doesn't understand how it happens. So the far, God, is, God is at work, 
when we are asleep and awake. The kingdom is working when we are watching and when we are not watching. God is, is doing something when we are aware of it and when we're not aware of it. Does anyone else ever get into the, the, uh, the mode of, of life where you, you think you just got to keep God accountable to doing what you think he should be doing or what he said he'd be do, doing? Anyone else? Is that just me? I need to repent if that is just me. I'm so sorry. But you see there, whether he's asleep or awake, whether he, he, he's there or not, God is going to do what God is going to do. The kingdom is going to produce what the kingdom was designed to produce, whether we're watching or waiting. As I was you know, reading this, I, was, I, I had this picture in my head of, um, of the farmer. And I didn't have a farmer's hat, so I have a Mexican hat, which is kind of the closest to a farmer hat that I could find. Mexican farmer. So the farmer has scattered the seed. And then, you know, I just have this picture of the farmer then kind of sitting there and just staring at the seed. Thinking that if he looks hard enough at the seed, that the seed is going to grow. Thinking that if he watches long enough, that the seed is going to do what it's meant to do. But the moment he takes his eyes off of the seed, then it's going to stop producing what it was supposed to produce. And then I thought, that's not just the farmer that I see doing that. That's me. When God is at work in something, and I get this kind of thing in my heart where I think, I've got to be watching to make sure that it's taking place. Because if I close my eyes, then nothing's going to happen. But this parable is saying... Regardless of whether you're awake or asleep, the kingdom is producing fruit. The kingdom is producing what it is meant to produce. It's not our responsibility to hold God to account or to think that if, if we just you know, stop watching, then he won't, he'll stop working. You can do that with your kids. We've got to do that with our kids with cleaning their room. My daughter just went, what? (laughs) Clean your room. And then we have to actually watch to make sure that she's cleaned her room. We have to come and inspect or check up to make sure that that you need to do that again or you haven't got around to that. Any other parents feel the pain there? It's not like that with God. If you, if you take your eyes off of the, whatever it is that's happening, he's still going to do what he wants to do. He is still in control, whether you are watching or whether you're not. Whether you're awake or you're asleep, he is still going to do what he wants to do. And so we see the seed go out and it starts to grow. It starts to mature. And whether you're asleep, as I was, I was reading that, I just felt to say, some of us need to sleep. Some of us actually need to take our hands off for long enough that we can rest and we can sleep. I don't know if if someone struggles with this where you lose sleep, like you literally can't sleep because you're worried about what's going to happen. You're worried about what's not going to happen. There's kind of a stress within our hearts and we can't even sleep. Guess what? You can sleep peacefully because he is in control and while your eyes are closed he is still at work you don't get, need to keep your eyes open to keep watching him he's going to do what he wants to do regardless the other thing we see there is that the farmer it, it, it starts to, to produce and it says even though he does not understand how it happens can I say again you don't have to understand everything that God does we don't need to understand everything, that, that, the way that God is doing everything for him to, to do it. We don't, he doesn't have to always give explanation to us for why it's working this way or why it's not working that way. I don't know if you've ever you know, shared the gospel with someone or maybe you've been caring for someone, you've been um, you know, serving, helping people and it doesn't look like anything is happening in their lives. And you're kind of like speaking the same and you're sharing and you're loving and you think, and you just don't understand what's going on. 
I don't understand what's, what's happening here. I don't understand why it's not working the way I thought it would work. I don't understand. I don't understand. We don't have to understand everything. That word understand, if you break that apart, you have two words. Understand. You're welcome. Where else are I going with this? When it comes to following God, even when we don't understand, we just have to stand under. We stand under His sovereignty. We stand under His word. We stand under His, His, His authority. And we, we understand that He is in control when we don't understand. We come under His covering. We come under His headship. We come under His authority. And there in that place, even though we don't have everything worked out, we can have peace in our hearts, knowing that he is in control. He does not understand how it happens. So let God be God. Let him do what only he can do. There are certain things that we can do. There are certain things that we can bring. But let, let, me, let me just say, most of it is God. He does the things that we cannot do. I cannot change someone's heart. I cannot restore someone's relationship. I cannot heal someone's body. But God can. And so when we step into the place where we're okay with you know, just doing what it is that we can do in obedience to him as he leads us, scattering seed, whatever it may be, then hands off and let God be God. Just let it go and let God be God. Let him do the work that only he can do anyway. Paul uh, says this as well in 1 Corinthians 3, 7. He says, it's not important who does the planting or who does the watering. What's important is that God makes the seed grow. It's not important who's doing this and that. The most important thing is that God is making the seed grow. The one who plants and the one who waters, they work together with the same purpose and they will both be rewarded for their hard work. For we are both God's workers and you are God's field. You are God's building. So we can sow, we can water, we can plant, but it's God that does the growing. It's God that does the increase. It's God that does that work. And a lot of the times we don't see what that work is. I had this once in prayer. I, was, I had an yeah, I was, I was struggling with some stuff, particularly with ministry and the weight of ministry. And I was praying once and just yeah, asking God, give me some revelation in this. And I felt he actually gave me a picture for me. Um, and I saw, I saw myself holding my hands like this with all this water. I had like a hand, two handfuls of water. And I was straining to try and hold this water and not drop any of it. And like, it didn't matter, as, as hard as I tried to hold on to this water, it just kept on leaking through. And I was like, that's exactly how I feel. I feel like I'm trying to hold it all together. And then I saw this picture like zoom back, and I was standing in God's hands, and in his hands was like this massive pool of water. And I just felt like, oh, I don't have to try and strain to hold this, because he's got it. He's got it. And all the little bits of water that I'm trying to save, he's got this huge amount of water. Like, it's incredible to let it go and let God do what only God can do. Then he says there, first a leaf, of, uh, first a leaf blade pushes through, then the heads of wheat are formed, and finally the grain ripens. As soon as the grain is ready, the farmer comes and harvests it with a sickle, for the harvest time has come. What else does Jesus want us to know? That the kingdom of God takes time to produce. That in God's time there is process. That it's not straight away the grain is ready. That first we see that there's a blade, a blade that's come through and then there's a head and then there it is ripe. It takes time. It's not just going to pop up overnight. So as we sow, as we let go... We've got to give time for God to grow that which he wants to. And don't try to harvest too quickly. It wasn't until the grain is mature that the sickle comes and the harvest takes place. Before that, it's like let it take time 
to come. Let it take time to do what it's going to do. You may, I feel to encourage parents this morning that have sown the seed of God's word in, the, in their kids' hearts. And right now, the kids aren't looking like they, they took anything on. They, they understood anything. Let God do the work in their hearts. As the seed has been sown, let it come to fruition. Just trust him. He watches over his word to perform it. He is in control. Be encouraged. Have hope. Hold fast. And he says there, and finally the grain ripens. And, and I, I don't know about you, but this, this is kind of me a, a lot of times. It's like, oh, finally. Oh, finally, God, we got here. We took a little bit of time, but finally. You know that kind of moment where you're like, oh, finally. That's when it comes, when it's mature, when it's ready. I share a story to finish. I had a. I used to work at Alter One. Is everyone familiar with Alter One um, School for? Uh, it's an alternative education for at-risk youth, and I worked there as a chaplain. And um, I was, we, we, you know, working as a chaplain with some of the the roughest kids in our area at that point in time. And we had one particular student who. Uh, he caused a lockdown once. The whole school had to go into lockdown because he um, was aggressive towards a teacher and had to lock the whole uh, you know, classrooms, put things up, a barricade against the wall, uh, against the door to kind of stop him from trying to kick through the door. He was quite angry, quite, but he was a, quite a strong young guy. And um, he was part of our school for, I don't know, maybe 6, 12 months. But in that time, I was kind of mentoring him and just coming alongside him and just, you know, helping him with little things and um, encouraging him, trying to help him change some of his behaviors that he had. And it felt like nothing was happening. I'd encourage him. He'd ask, how did I change my life? I'd tell him, you know, Jesus was the one that changed my life. I'd share with him scriptures. Uh, he, he wanted to get into boxing. It was the one thing that he really loved was boxing. And... Um, I bought him like these little weights so that he could go and do this hand weight boxing, encouraged him to chase that, to, to, to follow that. And uh, then he left. He, he actually got exited from the school and went off. And I, I didn't know what, what had happened. A few years later, I actually get a message from this guy on Facebook. Can, can you show that, Lockie? I've scrubbed his face out and his name out. But he messages me and he's like, he starts to say how much he was, how thankful he was. He says, I just want to thank you, thank you, man, for being a positive influence on my life. It's because of you that I boxed today. You gave me those hand weights that I still use this day, took me to my first gym, gave me that push that I needed to quit smoking. For some time now, I just want to thank you for believing in me, bro. I love to be forever grateful. Boxing brings me joy in my life. Without boxing or Jesus... I don't know what I would, where I would be. I'm also getting baptized in a week. So I just want to, know, I want to say that I love you, bro. Forever grateful. I'm fighting in February. Like, hadn't seen this kid for so long. And I thought he'd you know, gone off the, he'd gone wherever. But what was sown in, in a faith and obedience, though it took three or four years to come to fruition, it produced something in his life. He came to Jesus, and it wasn't while I was sitting there watching, trying to make sure that he was following what we were saying. God did it in his timing and brought him to that place. He's now over in the United States at a boxing camp. He's actually he's going semi-pro in boxing. You never know what happens if you just sow and then let go and let God do the growing. This is what the kingdom of God is like. The king does the work. We scatter, we sow, and then we leave it to him. Let him do what only he can do. I want to pray for us that this morning that um, maybe if we, we've been in a place where we're kind of holding on to things or we're struggling with certain things, that God will today to, to just release them into it, to cast our cares because he cares for us. For he loves us so deeply.
Maybe there's something in a family. Maybe there's something with your business. Maybe it's something uh, just in your personal life that you have been almost just straining and, and striving and trying to work so hard. I feel today God wants to give us peace in our hearts to just trust that he is in control. So let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for the way the kingdom works. It's not of this world. It doesn't look like this world. Lord, we can trust in you that you are in control and that you are at work. And this morning, we just bring those things to you. The areas that we may um, be struggling with, those areas that we may be holding on to, those areas that we find it really difficult to let go and just let you do what you want to do. And we pray for your grace today to lead us to that place where we can just surrender. Even as Elaine had said, to that place of surrender where we lay it down and we let you do what you need to do. Be it in our hearts or in others' hearts, in our family, friend, our businesses, whatever it may be. Today we just let it go and we let you do what only you can do. God, we bring those things and we pray for your grace. We pray for your grace. We thank you that as we trust in you, Lord, you will bring fruit from what you desire. That as your word goes forth, it produces the fruit that you desire. We can step back, stop, see, stop striving, trying to work, and allow you to do that work. And God, I pray that our lives are actually filled with testimonies where we say, wow, God did it. God moved. God, by his grace and his sovereignty, has done something incredible. Be it in the circumstance or in our hearts. And we thank you for this. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Be encouraged, let it go. Let him do what only he can do. He's a good God, he's trustworthy, and we don't have to understand it, we don't have to know exactly what it is. Amen? Amen. If you have come this morning and you haven't personally connected with Jesus, uh, we give the opportunity every week to make the decision to... Uh, Turn from your way of life, turn from your way of thinking and put your trust and your hope in him and um, become a disciple, become a follower of Jesus. If that's you today, be it older, younger, whatever it may be, if you want just even some information on that, uh, come and have a chat with us after service. Love to chat with you about what it means to follow Jesus and how you can do that and how we can help you to connect with community. Uh, but other than that, we're going to have some lunch. Hope you can stick around, grab something to eat, say hello to a few people, and uh, we'll see you next week for Mark chapter 5. And it's also Father's Day next week. We've got some special stuff for the, for the dads. So bring a dad, bring a lad, and we'll have a good time. Be blessed. We hope you've enjoyed listening to this podcast from Grace Life Church. For more information about us or any of our services, please visit our website at gracelife.com.au.